Because the Bible is a progressive revelation, and because line is upon line and precept upon precept, like a wall where each part is connected to every other part, when I discover a truth, it can ripple all the way across the Word of God. And one of the most important truths that you can grasp relative to the revelation of God, and particularly to the uh, dramatic change that occurs when we open the New Testament. We understand that the New Testament is built on the Old, but the writers of the New Testament want us to clearly understand that the sacrifices that are uh, endlessly provided in the Old Testament are not simply followed by another better sacrifice with Christ but an entirely different kind of sacrifice. There are many priests, many high priests, in a long line through the Old Testament. But when Christ comes, he is not a priest of the same order as Aaron. His priesthood is unique. And, and so it is uh, the prophets that came along. When Christ came, he was not simply another prophet, even the greatest prophet. He was, in fact, the incarnate word. And so as we read through the scripture and we come to this dramatic transition, <clears throat> we can miss some of the uh, force of that by not understanding that there were people in the world when Jesus came who had a living, vital relationship with God. They knew the Father, but they had not yet been introduced to the Son. And as Jesus would say, you believe in God, believe also in me. So when we come to John chapter 1, uh, we are introduced to, first of all, John the Baptist. John the Baptizer is the last of the Old Testament prophets. All the others were long-distance prophets looking down the road. And he was the one who had the privilege of saying, there he is, behold, the Lamb of God who bears away the sin of the world. So when John says uh, in chapter 3 and verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease, this is not simply a personal confession, a, a modus operandi for every believer, that as we move towards decreasing, we see the manifestation of Christ more and more in our lives. This is a cosmic declaration that the old things were going to slowly disappear as the growing glory of Christ was manifested. As Paul would write and say, that which was glorious had no glory by reason of the glory that excels. So like the stars that shine so brightly at night, when the sun comes out, we say, where did the stars go? Well, they're, they haven't gone anywhere. They're still there. But the glory of the sun so far exceeds their glory that they pale into insignificance. And this is what John is explaining to us, that uh, the Lord Jesus in coming, we read here, uh, he who comes from above is above all. All the others were born on earth, but he came from heaven. And his coming into the world is a full and final manifestation of the glory of the Lord. So in John chapter 1, we have, first of all, creation, right? In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, and so on. And then we have this rather dramatic transition from God speaking the light into the darkness in the first creation and God coming as the light into the new creation. Christ himself is the light and that light is the life of man. And so we have this creation scene and then the new creation, the creator of a new world to come. Likewise, beginning in verse 6, 
we have this idea of the prophets and how God has been a revelator. He has unfolded himself to us. We could not know God except as God reveals himself. But now he is fully and finally unfolding himself in the glory of the one who is the light. Likewise, beginning in verse 15 to verse 18, we have Moses and uh, the, the liberator, the one who brought his people out of Egypt, but now someone who is going to bring a greater liberation, who is going to deliver us from the power of Satan and translate us into the kingdom of his dear son. And so we read in this little section that Christ came and tabernacled among us. He pitched his tent among us. And this, of course, refers to this amazing story how God went camping with his people in order to draw near to them. He pitched his tent alongside theirs. And here we have the incarnate son, God himself, coming and pitching a little tent there uh, at Bethlehem and Nazareth and so on, living out this glorious truth. So the law came by Moses a wonderful revelation of the righteousness, the holiness of God. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Likewise, in verses 19 to 28, we're introduced to Elijah and the prophets, and, and John as the last of those prophets, and then all of them pointing forward to the ultimate prophet. And John says, this one is so great, I don't deserve to unloose the latchet of his sandal. Just a remarkable statement. And then we have, beginning in verses 29 down to 36, uh, at least inferred, the story of Noah and the ultimate judgment of God. And here we have this idea of the dove coming down from God out of heaven. And just as Noah sent the dove out from the ark and there were no clean place to land, now God's Holy Spirit comes in the form of a dove and finds one clean place to land. And that's on the head of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was justified in the Spirit. Finally, we have a little section on David and Solomon by inference, the building of a temple home a place where God is at home, and we have the Lord Jesus introducing this idea by renaming Simon a stone. When they come and say, where do you live? And he says, come and see. And then he says, Simon, you're no longer Simon. I'm going to call you a stone. And this idea that Christ has come to dwell among us, not on a visit, but in a permanent way, is going to build for God a temple out of living stones. And this is sort of climaxed for us, isn't it, in the book of the Revelation. And as we draw to the end of the chapter, again, by inference, we are introduced to Jacob, who, of course, is renamed Israel. And this idea that God is going to have a people out of all the nations who will take their spiritual lineage back to Abraham. And so we have this idea of um, Bethel and Jacob saying, God was in this place and I didn't know it. You could have written that over the nation of Israel relative to the Lord Jesus. God was in this place and I didn't know it. And so the Lord Jesus finishes the chapter with this amazing statement to Nathaniel. Most assuredly, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. And so at last we understand that that ladder that Jacob saw at Bethel, on which the angels were ascending and descending, was in fact Christ himself. He is the only ladder, the only link between earth and heaven between sinful men and a holy God, the only mediator between God and men, the God-man. So with this introduction in John chapter 1, we then go into a series of transition passages in the Gospel of John, which need to be understood in this context. And if not, we get all sorts of strange aberrations 
in our thinking in the gospel. So God help us as we look at this series now of transition passages in the gospel of John, that the Lord will help us hold this in our mind, that there were real people living on the earth, people like Zacharias and Elizabeth and Anna and Mary and so on, who had li a living vital relationship with God. They didn't know the Lord Jesus, but because they did know God, when they saw his son, they recognized him. We've found the Messiah, says Andrew to his brother. How did he know? He had seen the portrait of him in the Old Testament, but more. He knew his father, and Jesus was so like his father that they could recognize him right away. So God help us in this little study. I believe one of the, the key understandings that will open to us the scriptures when we understand this fundamental idea regarding the transition between the Old Covenant and the New, between all of these amazing stories, these illustrations, these prototypes, and the ultimate antitype, the fulfillment of all of these pictures and types in the Old Testament in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ.